the top 25 manners that we should teach our children and some adults, because manners are just an outward sign of inner character. That's today's topic on Coffee with Colleen. Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Colleen. I'm Colleen Hammond. I'm a former on-camera meteorologist for the Weather Channel, turned executive image consultant, coach, and business mentor. And 30 days or less, I help women dress for their body type, their coloring, and their career so that they could send the best image possible and feel good about themselves. Because don't you feel great when you're wearing your favorite outfit? Today we're talking about manners and the top 25 manners that we need to teach our children um, but quite frankly, when we start going through these manners, I think you'll see that um, a lot of people don't knew these as adults. So that's going to be today's topic is the top 25 manners that we should be teaching our children. And number one is to always say please and thank you. And send a thank you note. When's the last time you got a handwritten thank you note? You know, you want to talk about standing out uh, above everybody else. Send a handwritten thank you note. You know, uh, but manners at their core truly are character. It's virtue. It's how we treat other people who can't do anything for us. And one of the signs when you're dating or you're out with somebody or at a business meeting and you go out to a meal, you want to know a lot about somebody? See how they treat the server. How they treat somebody that can do nothing for them in return, except for bring them food. Um, but a great example of good manners I think, is the new Cinderella movie. Well, now it's not new. It's a few years old at this point. But right at the end, there was this amazing scene, which probably for copyright purposes, I can't show it because then YouTube will shut me down and Facebook will shut me down and all that kind of stuff. But you can look it up. She said right at the end, she, the stepmother was on the stairs and she was leaving the house with the prince. So this is right at the end of the movie. She says, I was not able to protect my father from you, but I will protect the prince and the kingdom, whatever comes of me. Why are you so cruel? You don't understand it. I tried to be nice to you, even though no one deserved to be treated like you treated me. I tried to be nice to you. Why did you do it? but I forgive you. And she turned and she left. Why did you? So even though the stepmother treated her so horrifically, she chose to be kind. And I just thought it was a very powerful message uh, in the movie and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. So it was her choice to have courage and be kind. Now, are we supposed to be a doormat? No. You know, but really she had no choice, right? So in her situation, she had no choice. She couldn't leave, you know, because of the situation. So she chose to be kind. So, you know, and if you want to get biblical, I can quote the Bible all day long on this one, but just start with the epistle of St. James. It's full of moral exhortations on how to treat other people. Get in the chapter, beginning of chapter two, uh, just loaded for respect for other people. Um, the dangers of uh, transgressing the law. Uh, faith without works is dead. That's all part of um, the uh, epistle of uh, St. James. So even Proverbs, train up a, chung, a train up a child. I haven't had my coffee yet today. Train up a young man according to his way, and even when he was old, he will not depart from it. So manners and, and the structure is an important part of our life. And who do we hurt when we're not nice to other people? We hurt ourselves, truly. So our goal in our family is to demonstrate, here's our quote, demonstrate Christ-like love and a servant's heart toward all, regardless of position, income, race, background, or outward appearance. So it's just true charity. So anyway, so number one is always say please and thank you and send a written thank you note. And I think a lot of the reason that people don't send thank you notes is they don't know how to do it. Their very first sentence they use is thank you for the gift, right? Actually, that's the last sentence. Thank you notes are pretty simple. It's a three-part process. You acknowledge the person, you acknowledge the gift, and then you say thank you. So for example, how, how surprised or how pleasantly surprised I was to get a note from you in the mail the other day. Uh, it was so good to see your name on the return label, whatever, right? Uh, so you acknowledge the person. Thank you for the gift of $20. Thank you for the gift of candlesticks. Thank you for the gift of whatever, right? So 
uh, and then you say, uh, you know, then, uh, then you say, I'm going to use the gift. This is how I'm going to use it. So you acknowledge the person, you acknowledge the gift, and you just can say how you're going to use it. So, I, and that's the thank you is the last thing you say. So how pleasantly surprised I was to see the candlesticks, which is great because we're having our pastor over on Saturday and now I can use them for dinner when he's here. Thank you for being so thoughtful. So th nice to see you. Thank you. You know, this was the gift and this is how I'm going to use it. Thank you. So always say please, always say thank you and send a thank you note. And quite frankly, even if you send a thank you text message or an email, it's probably going to put you above what other people are doing, right? So that's number one. Uh, number two. Let's go over to number two. Um, maybe we won't. There we go. <laughs> Don't interrupt people who are speaking with each other unless it's an emergency. I do not like interrupting people, especially precocious children who interrupt. <coughs> so we had a rule in our house that you not to interrupt. And I learned, I learned this method from somebody in a business situation, and I now apply it with my children, and I also use it in a business situation. So she was a very popular speaker, and I was traveling with her at the time. And I noticed that when all these people were surrounding her after her talk, that she would reach out and put her hand on the forearm of the next person that she was going to speak with. So she would have totally engaged eye contact with the person that she was currently speaking with, but she had her hand on the forearm of the next person she was going to speak with so that everybody would relax, right? And that she could focus on the person that she was engaged in a conversation with. She would finish with them and she would turn to the next person that she had her hand on their arm and then she would reach over and grab another person by their forearm to, to let them know that they were next. So she, this is how she controlled the crowd. I went, oh, I love this. So I applied that to our children. So if I'm engaged in a conversation and you want to speak with me, you come up and you put your hand on my forearm. I will put my hand over the top of your hand to acknowledge your existence and that you were there. And as soon as I'm finished, I will turn and speak with you, right? So that works really, really well. Well, we have, I like to have our house as party central because I want to keep an eye on what's going on. I can keep an eye on the kids' friends and all that kind of stuff. So everybody would be here. And that uh, the one day that the, one of the kids came up and they were like, and then if it's an important, you know, you say, excuse me. So my child, but I didn't have the excuse me process implemented yet. So one of the children came out and put their hand on my forearm. And then they started doing the, you know, the feet going up and down and then the hand beating on my forearm. And I you should have thought, well, this is a time to really teach a lesson. They need to prepare. They need to wait. They need to be patient because I thought it was kind of rude, you know, beating me on the arm and bounding their feet up and down. And so I made them wait just a little bit longer. And then I turned and said, yes, what is it? And somebody had fallen and there was blood and then began to find out later it was a broken arm. And, you know, I went, oh, great. <laughs> okay, so now we have a new rule. If it's really important and it's an emergency, say, excuse me. <laughs> so that's what we did with our children. So if they're talking, if I'm engaged in conversation, you can come and put your hand on my arm. I'll know that you want to speak with me. I'll finish the sentence. I'll let them finish their sentence, whatever's happening. And if it's important, you put your hand on my forearm and it's an emergency. You say, excuse me, mom, it's an emergency. And then I will interrupt the conversation and come to you. So, but we, we've become such an entitled society where we feel that our opinions are the most opinion on the planet and we can interrupt anybody when we want and we can do whatever we want. And, and that's a whole different talk about how we raise our children to become so entitled. Um, but you, you have to remember that there is a pecking order and there's a hierarchy. And right now as a child, you're not at the top of the pecking order, quite frankly, you know. Um, so you have to understand, and, and one of the favorite quotes that I love to use is Philippians 2.14, and do all things without murmuring and hesitation. That's a great parenting quote, so feel free to use it. Number three. Oh, how do I go back to this one? So we're trying to do this. Number three. It's not going to slide very well, is it? Keep negative opinions to yourself and share only with family or very close friends. <sighs> The world is not interested in negativity. And, you know, there's a time and a place 
to share your negative opinions and your negative thoughts. And there's certain people that you can share that with. But as we've talked about many times, that what you put, you know, what, what's going on in your brain over and over and over and over and over again, you know, what you think about, you bring about. And when you constantly think negative thoughts, I mean, so learning, teaching children to find the good in things and to look for the positive and to find the things to be grateful for is an amazing life skill. So that's number three is, is the people are not interested in your negativity. And if you want to look in the Bible, Ephesians 4.29 is a great place. Let no evil speech proceed from your mouth but only that which is good to the edification of the faith that it may administer grace to the healers. Or Ephesians 5, 4, no obscenity or foolish talking or scurrility, which is to no purpose, but rather to the giving of thanks. So to focus on gratitude, to focus on uh, the positive. Number four, don't call people mean names. Uh, it's just so rude, so mean, so unnecessary. Don't comment on their clothing uh, or their physical characteristics. You know, that that's, we're watching Anne with an E, right? On Netflix, the new Anne of Green Gables, which I thoroughly am enjoying. It's kind of like a little house on the prairie where it's not exactly like the book. It's close enough. And then they take a little bit of liberty here and there, but it's a series instead of just a movie. It's a, it's a series. So they're commenting on her red hair. Well, she has no control over that. That's how she was born. Or her freckles. She has no control over her angel kisses, right? That's how she was born. So you don't want to make fun of anybody for any reason, but especially for their physical characteristics. Oh my goodness, it's not their fault if they were born with a, you know, big ears or a big nose or large hands or freckles or more, you know, whatever is they're born with that they can't do anything wrong. How, why would you tease somebody about that? Why would you teach somebody in general, right? But especially about physical characteristics, because words are important. Words are powerful. Words have such an amazing, amazing ability to build up or tear down. And it takes 10 positives to counteract one negative. So one, one negative comment can really send people into a tailspin, especially children. So teaching children to look for the positive and look for ways to compliment other people, to look for things to be grateful for. Uh, in Mark 9, 37, it says, John answered him saying, Master, we saw someone casting out devils in thy name, and he doesn't follow us, so we forbid him from doing that. That's how powerful words are, that even though somebody may not believe, the power of those words can still have impact um, and meaning. So don't call people mean names. Number five, when people ask you how you are, tell them fine, and then ask them how they are. This kind of goes back to the world doesn't want to hear about your negativity <laughs> and the world doesn't want to hear about how horrible things are, right? Because um, there's a time for everything. There's, there's people that you want to share these things with and there's people that don't need to be hearing it, right? So um, just, it, it's a manner of social convention. Hey, how you doing? People really don't want to know the, the minute details of how, it's an icebreaker. It's the way we start conversations. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Fine. Hey, what's going on with you? Know, so it's a man, it's just a, it's a social convention to break the ice and get the conversation moving. It's not really that people want to know, well, so how are you doing today? Well, let me tell you what my husband did this morning. That's not what it's all about. So there's a time to speak and there's a time not to speak and everything has their season. See Ecclesiasticus, right? And James 1.19 says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, and also Proverbs 24, 17 and 18 talks about not rejoicing at other people's bad things. When your enemy falls, don't be glad and in his ruin, don't let your heart rejoice. So always keeping positive and keeping things um, uh, upbeat. Number six, be a good guest. Be a good guest got to be a guest, you might as well be a good guest, right? First of all, be on time if you're going to be a good guest. Ask if anything, there, there's anything you can do to help. 
no running, no door slamming. And of course, if you practice all these behaviors at home as children and adults, um, then you won't be doing this when you go to other people's home. Because again, there's no such thing as company manners. Manners are inner moral characters exhibited in an outward manner. So when you can't have company manners, because that's false, that's just putting on airs. That's acting big, as the kids say, right? So no running, no door slamming. Always clean up after yourself. Uh, after you've spent time at your friend's house, remember to thank them for having you over and thank you for the for having a nice time there. So again, you when you arrive at somebody's home, and you know, being a good host is important too, but when you arrive at somebody else's home, I always told my children, ask the adult if there's anything you can do to help. And my oldest son, Ian, said, and this is when he was a little child, right? He said, yeah, but what if they give us something to do? What if they say, yeah, and they put me to work? I started laughing. I said, well, chances are they're not going to put a 12-year-old in charge of something. It's just good manners to offer your help. I don't want people interfering in my kitchen, so I'm not going to put people to work in my kitchen. But it's a nice gesture to say, hey, is there anything I can do to help? No, that's okay. I have it, but thank you for asking. Now, I picked this up because a friend of mine's children always asked me if, if there was something they could do to help. I went, that's so polite. I really like that, you know, but no, thank you. Get out of my kitchen, but thanks. You know, it was just nice to be offered, right? So, and the other thing is I don't like, um, like parlor tricks. You know, what do you say to Mrs. Smith? You know, so we had a code. Uh, when we would, I would pick up my children at another friend's house, um, we had this little secret phrase. Did you have a good time? And that was their reminder, if they hadn't done so already, that was their reminder to turn and thank the hostess. Thank you for having us over. I had a great time. So instead of saying, did you thank Mrs. Smith, which is, it puts a child on the spot. It, it just, it's just so phony and everything. It was like, hey, did you have a good time? Oh, I did. Thank you so much, Mrs. Smith, for having us over. I had a great time. I hope we can come again. So it, it helps children be the star. It helps them, just reminds them gently with that little secret code phrase of, of building in good manners. So treating company, always having hospitality toward one another, um, etc., is important. So number seven, uh, gosh, knock on closed doors and wait to see if there's a response before you enter. <sighs> you know, we had to, we had to add the wait and see if there's a response before you enter part, part of this because the children um, were like knocking on doors and then just going in, right? It's like, no, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You knock on the door and you wait for a response before you enter. And as an adult, I know I've spoken about this before, but I'm going to repeat this again because this is the greatest advice I ever got. It was a friend of mine who had 12 children, Diane, God rest her soul. And this was well before I had children. So it had to be a good 30 years ago. She said, when you have children, you are deaf in the bathroom. I said, what do you mean? She said, because children will find you wherever you are. If you're on the phone, if you're on the bathroom or wherever you are, and you'll never have any private time unless you train them young to give you your privacy. So we had, I implemented that right away. And sure enough, you go into the bathroom and there's knocking on the door. There's questions, you know, I'll be on a minute. Leave me alone. Right? So I just like, I can't hear you. Well, before the age of reason, by the time they're like three or four years old, they can't really, they don't have that logic center quite working in their brain. So they don't know that, you know, what you're saying, they can't, you can't really hear them, right? They knock, hey mom, can't hear you, right? Hey mom, can't hear you. So, uh, yeah, sure enough, uh, they figured it out. And then when they got older, they would write notes. They wouldn't be shouting through the door, but they would write notes on a piece of paper. Can I go over to so-and-so's house? Circle yes or no. And they'd slide little notes underneath the door. And I would just like slide them back. Can't hear you. <laughs> so much so that a couple of years ago, I remember I was coming out of the bathroom and I came out and, and both of my sons are really, really tall. Um, and my one son, he's like six foot seven, six foot eight now, I think. At the time, I think he was only six foot six. And I came out of the bathroom and boom, there he was. He said, Mom, I wanted to ask you a question. But he had been trained to not speak to me when I'm in the bathroom. So it's been one of the most powerful and wonderful things that has happened for me uh, is being deaf in the bathroom. So teaching your children to respect a closed door, to knock and then wait to hear a response before you enter is an important thing to do. Number eight 
is proper phone manners. And I found this out that I hadn't really taught proper phone manners when I heard my son answering and making a phone call. And, and then when my girlfriend's, I heard him, and then when my girlfriend's son called my house. <laughs> so he was like, I answered the phone, hello? Connor there? And I said, I'm sorry, who is this? There was silence on the other end of the phone. Connor there? I said, well, who is this? He goes, well, it's Joe. I said, oh, hello, Joe. How are you? I didn't realize it was you. He goes, well, didn't, see you, didn't you see my name on caller ID? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't, which I did. So teaching proper phone manners um, is um, introducing yourself. You know, hi, Mrs. Hammond, this is Joe. How are you today? Fine, thank you, how are you? Real good, is Connor there? Just takes a second, acknowledges the other person's existence and that they do exist and they are alive and that they are not people's secretaries and they just should deserve some respect, right? So uh, also teaching your children how to make introductions is really important. important. Uh, how to make a good handshake, using good eye contact, speaking up loudly, clearly, enunciating, not mumbling, not shuffling your feet, not looking down and using a firm handshake. And sometimes you have to teach these things one at a time. You know, you can approach your pastor, you know, after church on Sunday and, and teach them to, you know, look father in the eye, reach out, firm handshake, speak up, speak clearly. You know, you might have to take it one step at a time. Um, but just teaching proper introductions, proper phone manners uh, and good handshakes is essential. Number nine, Never, ever use foul language. Uh, as the um, Dowager said in Downton Abbey, vulgarity is no substitute for wit. And my dad used to say growing up, it's, it's uh, people who aren't intelligent enough to think of a better word that result to foul language. And it has become so prevalent in our society the F word, it's just this foul language all over the place is just accepted, I think, as part of the language and, and part of the, our culture. And it's not accepted in business. It's not accepted in the workplace. But I see it as everyday language and I hear it in everyday language in the stores and, and whenever we're out. And it really is a sign of respect and intelligence um, to use uh, different words. Number 10, offer to carry bags, bags, <laughs> bags, boxes, heavy things for other people, especially for the women and for the elderly. This came about when we decided to teach this one when we were at, my husband and I were at a conference and he noticed this uh, young, this young lady carrying this big box, it was much bigger than the one that was in the picture, carrying this big box up a flight of stairs. And behind her was walking three young men. They're probably 14, 15, 16 years old. And they're walking behind her with their hands stuffed in their pockets. Now, my husband, Dennis, is not a person to intervene or to say anything. And, but we, we were at this conference as a husband-wife team and we were teaching a class on manners, so he thought it was okay. So he went over to the one of the young men and he tapped him on the shoulder and he said, why don't you offer to carry that box for her? And he said, we did, Mr. Hammond, she won't let us. And this brings up a very interesting point that it's an act of humility and charity. If someone offers to do something for you, it's an act of humility and an act of charity to say yes and thank you and allow them. If they have stepped outside their comfort zone and offered to help, especially men, men don't necessarily step outside their comfort zone to offer to help. And now in our culture, they have been shot down so many times by women, I think, me being one of them initially, that they don't offer anymore. Case in point, when, when we first started kind of doing this and experimenting with it, I did a social experiment because I travel quite often, not as much now as I used to. My goal now is to spend more time at home and do live feeds as opposed to traveling places. And, but I used to spend a lot of time, I was on a plane almost every weekend, every other weekend for a number of years promoting my book and traveling and speaking at different conferences. And 
I remember getting on the plane. Of course, when you travel with your books, you don't check your books, right? Because they're really heavy. And you'll quickly go over your 40, 45 pound limit. So, but they don't have a weight limit on carry-ons. Hmm. Anyway, so I can stuff a lot of books in a carry-on, stick it underneath my seat. So I, I remember it was coming on. And I, so I kind of like, let me see what happens. So I was going to put my, my bag in the overhead. And I was kind of struggling it with a little bit. And I looked and back toward the back of the plane, about four or five men. And they're both, they're all in that boat. They're all kind of leaning out the aisle, looking up and watching me struggle with this bag, but nobody offered to help me with it until I went <sighs> and two or three of them like jumped up. Excuse me, you need help with that? It's like, as soon as I got exhausted, they weren't going to offer until I turned and asked for help. And then after they put it up in the bed, they were like slaying dragons, you know, it was just wonderful, right? So if somebody offers to help you, be humble enough to say, thank you even if it's for a four pound bag of sugar. I, a gentleman helped me the other day in the grocery store and I, I, he was probably my age, so in his fifties. And I said, um, oh, chivalry is not dead. Thank you so much. He goes, chivalry better not be dead. And then he, he got all upset. He goes, I don't like it when I see these young men that won't help these women. And I think you did. He just went on and on and on. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> you're preaching my, you're preaching my, my sermon there, sir. So offer to carry bags, bags, boxes, heavy things for other people, especially the elderly. I, I know that they'll appreciate it the most, right? So number 11, when in a standing room only function, offer to relinquish your seat, especially to women or to the elderly. Again, you know, it's just a common courtesy. You know, somebody is, is older than you, or you see somebody with a disability, or um, really how much energy does it take to stand at a function and offer somebody else your seat? It's part, all of these you'll notice are just being observant in the world of things that are happening around you and being conscious of other people's discomfort, their disability, um, their inability to carry a bag, load a car, push a cart, all these things we can, if we just observe the people around us and how long does it take an extra 20 seconds out of your day to help somebody lift a bag or load their car or grab their cart in the parking lot and take it into the store with you, you're going in anyway, or grab a cart and go take it across and put it in, especially now here in the heat. Now in Texas, we're getting into the spring summer months and it's starting to get a bit warm. So just offering to take somebody's cart for them, especially the elderly where they, they, they may not handle the heat as well and put the cart away to save them an extra minute or so in the hot sun. It's just an act of, of um, being observant and, and an act of charity. Number 12, if you bump into someone, say, excuse me, <laughs> I am absolutely amazed the number of times that people will crash into me and not say a word, normally because they're on their phones, right? And they just keep going on blithely through life, just kind of like walking around like nobody, nothing's happened in their Mr. Me planet. They're the only person around. So if you do happen to bump into somebody, make sure that you say, excuse me. Also, number 13, looking around, again, being observant to other people to see if you can hold a door open for someone else. I am amazed at the number of people and maybe part of this has come about because we have these automatic doors. But I remember this was just two years ago. I was at a conference and I was walking in. These people saw me in the parking lot. I had my arms full of books. I was towing a drag part, you know, dragging suitcase type of thing behind me. So it was um, a man, um, a husband and wife. And they were walking ahead of me. They saw him in the parking lot. It was smiled, said hi, right? And they were talking, I was speaking with each other. And I was probably six feet behind them. They saw me, everything I was carrying and all that kind of stuff. They walked in and instead of just turning around and holding the door open for me, he knew I was right behind him. The door shuts. I was so mad. I stood outside and I started kicking the door. It was like, it's tapping and it kicking. I wasn't breaking the windows or anything. I started tapping the bottom of the door. I'm like, hello, you know, because I was loaded down. And he turned around. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. He didn't see you. He saw me in the party lot, but it didn't register. 
He just wasn't paying enough attention or being observant enough to know that, yeah, I, I was there, I was behind him, my arms were loaded. And so look for situations where you can hold the door open for someone either going in or coming out. And again, we have a lot of automatic doors now, so it's a little bit different. So, but look for those opportunities. And this one doesn't happen all the time, but the ability to offer your umbrella to women or the elder, elderly for shelter. And it doesn't, rain doesn't bother me. I don't care about getting wet that much, you know, um, but it, it's nice that, and it doesn't rain a lot here. Like we get a lot of rain this time of year in the spring and then it, we won't get any rain all summer. So a lot of times you don't, people don't even carry umbrellas in their car or anything like that. So um, it's, it's interesting that people don't offer their umbrellas. And now you have those big golf umbrellas that are like six feet wide. There's plenty, there's a room for a small family underneath those. Uh, so if you see that opportunity, again, it's just looking around, being observant of the things that are going on around you. Number 15, cover your mouth, please. When you cough, sneeze, or yawn, and please don't pick your nose in public. <laughs> yeah. I, and the other thing you want to teach children, if you're coughing or sneezing, not to do it into your hand, but doing it into your sleeve. Nothing worse than people are like, oh, <coughs> nice to meet you. You know, oh, I don't want to touch your hand. You know, I just saw where it was. And you were just coughing and sneezing. So teaching children to cough and sneeze in into their, their arm, their sleeve, their elbow, whatever you, their inner elbow, you want to ever crook of your arm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but please, when's the last time you saw somebody cover their mouth when they yawned? Why did this stop being a thing? You know, I don't want to see people's dental work. It's gross. It's kind of hideous. <laughs> uh, number 16, as a child, when an adult asks you to do something, do it with a smile and don't grumble. You can learn a lot. You, you know, nothing worse. You can learn a lot by working with somebody else, right? But also, and I, I don't, my children do this sometimes too, still as adults. It's like, you know, except for Connor. Connor's real, well, actually, I don't think they do anymore. Come to think of it. They're all really good about this now. So I take that back. My children don't do this anymore. But it used to be that even if it's a facial expression, you know, they don't even have to say anything. So I, I used to time them too. It's like, seriously, how long is this going to take you to rinse and load your plate? Oh, look, seven seconds. Ooh, boo-hoo, seven seconds out of your day. Rinse and load your, your stuff after you've used it, right? Get it in the dishwasher and rinse it off before it gets all dry and crusty and then you got to pick it off or soak it. So just if someone asks you to do something, okay. And if an adult, for an adult asks a child to do something, they should do it immediately without grumbling. Within reason, obviously, right? So, but just in general, to get rid of this grumbly, eye-rolling, attitude if somebody asks you to do something. It's just not necessary. Number 17, of course, you know, this is a big one for me. Dress properly for each occasion. We've lost that, haven't we? Do you watch video clips from, you know, any time over all of human history up into the 50s? It wasn't really until the mid 60s, even the beginning of the 60s, Remember Jackie Onassis with her pillbox hat and the gloves and the lipstick and everybody, you know, it really wasn't until we got into this rebellion into the mid, mid 60s and late 60s that we lost that cultural acceptance that you look nice when you leave the house because you're representing your family and the family name and you're representing yourself. And how much extra energy does it take to dress properly as opposed to dressing sloppily? Casual doesn't mean careless. So you can dress casual without looking careless and sloppy. So learning and people don't need, I get questions all the time. What I, I was just invited to something and this is the dress code. It says semi-formal, it says formal, it says black tie, it says white tie. What's the difference between black tie and white tie? You know, so we've, we don't even know what dress codes mean anymore. It was funny. My husband's at an IBM conference right now and 
it said smart business casual. He goes, what, as opposed to dumb business casual? What does that mean, smart business casual, you know? Because people don't know what business casual means anymore because they see the word casual and they think sloppy, careless, I can wear my sweatpants, you know? So maybe they, IBM thought by putting smart business casual, it would, you know, say, I don't know, wear glasses or something. So we got a good laugh out of that one yesterday. But dressing properly for every occasion. And it's okay to slightly overdress for something. That's okay. I mean, you want don't want to show up overly, overly dressed. But it's okay to slightly overdress for an occasion um, than it is to underdress for an occasion. Number 18, learn and then use <laughs> proper table manners. We started this at as very young children. And right from the beginning, we would have a bowl of pennies and I would sit at the table and I would reward children for good manners at the kitchen table. So after we would say grace before a meal, the very first thing they were to do is take their napkin and put it in their lap with their left hand. Everybody in my family is right-handed. So they would take their napkin in their left hand and, and hold their napkin in their lap. Now in Europe, in other countries, you, you want to be able to see both hands. So, you know, they have both wrists are on the table and both hands are present, right? Present and accounted for, nothing weird going on. So, you know, so, but that's different. But in the United States, the tradition is that your left hand is in your lap if you're eating right-handed. And if you're eating left-handed, your right hand is in your lap with your napkin. And you're not, you don't have elbows on the table and that type of thing. So anytime a child would exhibit proper table manners, I would reward them with a penny. And if it was really good at the end of the meal, whoever had the best manners uh, got a quarter or something, right? So train them with positive reinforcement growing up. Um, napkin checks, rinse and load, push in your chair after a meal to stand up, push your chair in, take your plate, rinse and, you know, rinse it off in the kitchen sink, rinse and load all of all of your dinnerware or anything you used for the meal. Um, waiting till everybody is seated before you start to eat. Use how to use the tinsel, utensils properly, what ones to use, how to work from the outside in, what to do with your knife, how to put place your silverware on your plate so that if you're at a restaurant, the server knows that you're done. Uh, sitting up straight, chewing with your lips together. So anytime you have food in your mouth, making sure your mouth is closed, um, you know, cutting small bite sizes. And they did this in the military and a friend of mine that went to West Point and he said they were, they had to eat fast, first of all, <laughs> because their, their meal times were really short, but they had to, he said, you had to be really careful and cut your food in really small pieces and only put a little bit of food in your mouth at a time. Cause at any moment, one of the commanders or whom, whomever would walk around and ask you a question and you can't speak with you have food in your mouth. And if you have a ton of food in your mouth, you can't swallow it fast enough to speak and you'd get in trouble, you get demerits or whatever. So learning to cut small bite-sized pieces to eat your food. Um, don't do this pinky finger thing. That's actually an insult. Um, you, you know, so there's so many different things, staying at the table and wait until be excused. There's so many different table manners. I could teach an hour and a half or three hours on table manners. Uh, also remembering that if somebody has served food that they don't like, offer it up and eat it anyway. Luke 10, eight into whatever city you enter and they receive you eat the things that they set before you. So you can throw some Bible quotes at your children too. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever else you do, do it all for the glory of God. So good table manners. Number 19, be a good sport, whether you're winning or whether you're losing. To always be a good sport. Be a good winner. Congratulate those that you competed against. Be a good loser. Congratulate the winner. Nothing worse, and we see this more and more and more in college and, and sometimes even in pro, where somebody will lose and they will refuse to show. You know how, especially like in football, um, and they do it in baseball and other sports too, it, after the game, they will pass each other and high five each other, the, the two opposing teams, right? And sometimes somebody will be so upset, they'll just, oh, look how passionate he is about the game. No, look how rude he is and how self-centered and conceited he is that he can't congratulate the winner. And then sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So teaching our children to be a good winner, as well as um, learning how to lose and congratulate the winners. And this starts with board games. This starts with checkers. This starts with, you know, all the games that we play at home, teaching children to be 
good winners and good losers. And of course you can say second uh, Timothy 2.15, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So always following the rules in a game. Philippians 2.3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. And Proverbs 25.27, it's not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek your own glory. So there's some uh, good Bible quotes to throw around as well. So next up, mobile phones. Oh my gosh. <laughs> phone, this is kind of phone etiquette in general, but I'm talking about cell phones. And if you need to be on the phone in public, keep your voice down. There's speakers in the phone. You don't have to be loud. Everyone doesn't have to know your business. I see this often. Again, I spend a lot of time in airports. I see this often in airports. I've seen it in church where people will answer their phone during church, you know? Wow, at least take it outside. One man, I saw he stood up and got in the side aisle. I'm like, if you got out to the side aisle, you could have kept walking and kept going and gotten out of the church so you wouldn't distract other people. And I understand that some people are, you know, doctors or lawyers or parents that have an emergency situation and children that aren't there with them. I understand. Leave and answer the phone. Don't text or use your phone when you're in the company of other people. You know, nothing, we're, we're, you know, you, see, you look over and then people are like this all the time don't and quite frankly this has come in kind of handy because you can just kind of glance i can see if it's important you can just glance down it's almost like you're checking the time uh and i know if i'm expecting an important call or something like that but even at that i mean it, it just gets to the point where uh you're just telling everybody else that they're not important it can wait 99 percent of the time unless it's an emergency right it can wait 30 seconds it can wait a minute or two it can wait five minutes really it can so learning to use your mobile phone by not using your mobile phone. Men, we've totally lost track of this one. Don't wear your hat indoors. Take your hat off. How, how, when did this become an okay thing to be wearing your hat 24-7? It's not good for your hair either. You want to know, you know. Your hair is there to insulate the top of your head. And I think if you wear a hat too much, your hair is going to fall out. So there are rules too about learning proper hat etiquette. When you take your hat off, of course, facing it towards your body, nobody wants to see the sweaty inside of your hat, right? It's kind of gross. So just a common courtesy, just kind of when you take your hat off to keep it close to you, so that the inside, you know, that nobody can see the inside. And where this came from is that, Knights would remove their helmet in the presence of a king because it would display vulnerability. It would display trust that the other person wasn't going to kill them because they're holding their helmet in their dominant hand, their sword hand. So it was a vulnerability issue and it was a sign of respect and trust and building relationship that you would remove your helmet or your hat. And they would also remove their helmets in church um, because of sanctuary and, and that type of thing, um, seeking sanctuary and whatnot. But this, so this goes way back that you remove when you enter into a building or you're in the presence of other people, you remove your hat. So there's a lot of rules, especially in the United States, we have a lot of flag code, uh, when to remove your hat, you remove your, your hat as a sign of respect when passing a church. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things, um, that you do, um, when you can leave your hat on indoors, uh, as opposed to outdoors too, uh, at an athletic event, indoors or outdoors, wearing a hat is okay. Uh, public transportation, uh, it's okay to leave your hat on, uh, public buildings like, uh, airports where there's in and out, in and out, in and out, uh, those types of things are okay to wear your hat in or if it's a health condition obviously you want to be okay with that one too number 22 learn to help other people put on their coats or their jackets and we had to teach this one specifically because we don't wear a lot of coats and jackets because it's so hot here in the south so rarely do we have that time of year where a coat or a jacket is necessary but just to teach another person how to help anybody on with their coat or their jacket that you don't hold it up at shoulder level this is hard to display because you can't see my whole but um but when you when you're helping somebody on what's the first thing that's going to go into the coat or jacket 
their hands. So you have to hold the armholes down low by their hands so they can get their hands in. Otherwise, a lot of people just hold the jacket up by somebody's shoulders. I'm like, because that's where the shoulder holes are. Those are sleeves. You got to put your hands in the sleeves. So, and if it's a very long coat, you drape the end of the coat over your, your forearm and then over your forearm, and then you can hold the jacket, you know, by the collar, but you're holding it down low by the hands so that somebody could easily slip their hands. And then you pull it up their arms and over their shoulders. So teaching people how to help somebody else on with a coat or a jacket uh, is a useful skill that we've lost. Number 23. Men walk on the danger side. And there's a lot of outside rules that go along with this. And there's a lot of misconception about this. So people say, oh, no, 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 Men um, are supposed to walk on the inside because people would empty their chamber pots out of the upper windows. Okay, this is an urban legend, number one. Uh, number two, you have to understand how buildings used to be built back in the day when people were emptying their chamber pots are. They were not straight up. The first floor was in, and then there was an overhang, and then the second floor, third floor, fourth floor was up further. So if a man was walking on the inside, the woman would be on the outside, she would actually be in the line of chamber pot. So that's that's an urban legend. So the man always walks on the area that's closer to the danger. So he would walk on the outside closer to the street because it was closer to carriages, it was closer to water being splashed um, in, in those situations. In a restaurant, a man is going to allow a woman to go first. So there's different places to understand the etiquette of who leads, who follows. Um, and, and it's just a sign of respect. It doesn't mean a woman's weaker. A man is offering to be there as a sign of respect for a woman that, I, you know, I am honoring you. I am not saying that you are less than me. I'm actually honoring you by protecting you and, and putting myself in harm's way instead of you. So I don't see it as an insult at all. And I, I don't understand where that concept comes from. I, you know, I think it's a sign of respect when a man offers to put himself in danger to protect me. Thank you. Nothing wrong with that. Number 24, holding open the car door especially for women of the elderly. You know, my husband still to this day, been married for over 30 years, will go to, when we get into the car, he'll always open my car door for me. It's something he did when we were dating and he still does it. He opens my car door for me. It's just that extra little sign. And I don't mean like unlocking it from the key fob. I mean, he goes to that side of the car and opens the door for me. And I, I just adore that. I think it's just that one tiny little extra um, sign of care and protection and respect and consideration that other people um, don't necessarily do. So holding the door for somebody. Also, the thing with looking out for people is... You know, like the other day, my girls and I were at the store and my one, my one daughter has problems with her a bulging disc and whatnot. And every once in a while, it'll act up and she'll have some sciatica problems. And I'm like, you just wait here, I'll run and get the car. Or it was really hot uh, yesterday, actually, when we were at the school, uh, getting them signed up for their classes. And I said, well, you, you know, there's no sense in all three of us putting ourselves out in the heat and the humidity. I'll run and get the car. You guys stay in the air conditioning. I'll go get the car and I'll pick you up at the door. Um, or dropping somebody off at the door in the heat or if it's raining or something like that. One person needs to get wet. Why does everybody have to get wet? So dropping everybody out, uh, looking for those little extra common courtesy, which isn't so common anymore, things that we can do for other people. And of course, number 25, which for me, I used to put at number one, but there were people that would be late to my presentation. So now it's at number 25, <laughs> be on time. Being on time shows other people that you respect them and you're not putting yourself at the center of the universe. 
So if you want a copy of these notes and you're watching live, just comment me in the comment section below. If you're watching on my blog or on YouTube, make sure you send me a note on Facebook and the link will be in the show notes. Uh, and if this is something that you can think of somebody else will benefit from, please like, comment, and share. If I've missed any manners, please make sure that you put those in the comment section below. And again, if you're watching me on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and then click the little bell because the bell is actually what will let you know when I um, will be sending out new information. So thanks for joining us. It looks like we recorded and I'm so excited that worked out really well. And we'll see you next time. Take care. And if you're watching live, I'll be right back. Bye now.